let's, uh, let's join together in call to worship for this first Sunday in the month of August. All who hunger, gather gladly. We come to feast on the life-giving word. Here, love abounds and grace overflows. Here, blessings multiply as gifts are shared. Come. Let us pour ourselves out in prayer and praise. And open ourselves to renewal and rest. The amazing good news is that when we confess, we are forgiven. We are forgiven, and that gives us strength to move out and love as we're asked to love. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's uh, pass the peace. Let's do that. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Peace be with you, Jeannie. Peace, Derek. Peace be with you, Tony. Peace. The peace of Christ.
always a good day for a sob, isn't it? Oh, excuse me as I adjust my... You can take my, it off. Can I take it off? Sure. Wait, miss it? Okay. All right. So we're going to read responsibly from Psalm 17. We're going to do 1 through 7, and then we'll skip to 15. I'll start, and you follow. Hear, <coughs> wow, that was interesting. Hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from lips free of deceit. From you, let my vindication come. Let your eyes see the right. If you try my heart, if you visit me by night, if you test me, you will find no wickedness in me. My mouth does not transgress. As for what others do, by the words of your lips, I have avoided the ways of the violent. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied beholding your likeness. likeness. There were absolutely no words that needed to be changed. <laughs> so that was interesting, but just for the future reference, right? Absolutely. Okay, so um, would you like me to read the Genesis, John? I would. All right. So we continue. And you know, it's funny because that psalm it talks about the same distress in the night. I will come to you, and mm -hmm. I'm not worried about anything that I've done. I'm right. uh, righteous now. The writer of the psalm might have been deceived, but certainly Jacob couldn't say that. No, and I smirked. <laughs> I smirked when I was saying it too. I mean, I can't say that I, none of the things that come out of my mouth are, are, are ever the wrong thing. So yeah, so we're, we have this continued story of Jacob whose name, you know, means heal. The guy in the whole story has done things that are deceitful, and his comeuppance may be coming. His comeuppance, his brother's on the way. And so let's listen now to a continuation of this his brother's story. brother's got 400 guys with him. Yeah, and his brother's like, hey, man. <laughs> and yeah, so this, again, we continue in the dysfunctional family, God's people. <laughs> Here we go, Genesis 32. 22 through 31. That same night, he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Mm. What a story. If you uh, ever have a chance, you might want to pick up a book called The Messenger of the Gods, uh, Messengers of the God, uh, which is by Elie Wiesel. And uh, it is, uh, as a rabbi and a religious teacher, Elie Wiesel uh, tells the stories of uh, the um, people of the Bible using Midrash, uh, some of the commentary that comes to us from the hands and the thoughts and minds of the, the rabbis over the years. It's um, not uh, necessarily biblical, but it is uh, a, like commentary about the Bible. And well, he was, Elie Wiesel brings these stories really to life in a remarkable way. Um, the gospel for today is from Matthew chapter 14, 
verses 13 through 21. Many of you will uh, recognize this story as the feeding of the 5,000. So uh, please turn in the Bible to Matthew chapter 14. And if you are comfortable doing so, let's uh, rise as we hear the gospel for today. Do we still have any problems? Uh, there's some people who can't hear, so maybe we should lift this up. Okay. Not sure why. Very good. No problem. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when Jesus heard this, and uh, what that refers to is to the uh, death of John the Baptist, who was executed in prison by Herod, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. And then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. Here ends the reading of God's word from the gospel for this morning. May God add a blessing to our hearing. Well, today I get to preach a little bit about something I care very much about, which is uh, uh, compassion and the idea that we should show compassion to other people as modeled by um, Jesus himself in the gospel. And I think uh, a couple of the, the blogs that I was reading this week were talking about, uh, is it a miracle or is it not? And, uh, one of the writers uh, said that certainly the creator of all that is, who created the universe from nothingness, can easily multiply, multiply a few loaves and fish. So is it that remarkable a miracle? Um, another writer was saying, of course, and I've, I've said this before, that the real miracle was that uh, perhaps the, the fish and the loaves weren't multiplied, but that people's hearts were opened and they shared with their neighbors. And when they went to collect what was left over, there was so much, there were 12 basketfuls, and perhaps the, the fact that Jesus, by his words and instructions, moved people to open their hearts and share with their neighbors was more of a miracle than multiplication of the original fish and loaves. That's a possibility too. But one of the other writers suggested that we bypass uh, the miracles in the text of the multiplication of the loaves and the fish and also the healing of all the sick. And we talk more about the miracle of that word compassion. In the text, Jesus is trying to get away. That's an appropriate text for the first week in August, uh, a week when many people start their vacations. Of course, in these days of COVID-19, I'm not sure uh, what uh, that has done to our calendar and to the regular rhythm of our life. But many people are trying to get away and get away from the, the stress and the anxiety that COVID-19 has caused. Jesus uh, is trying to get away for another reason. He has just heard that his friend, uh, his cousin, John the Baptist, has been executed. And uh, he is withdrawing, perhaps um, out of anxiety, out of fear feeling that they may be threatened. He is withdrawing perhaps to get rest and uh, to come away and think about what does this event mean for him. And there's always the possibility that he was withdrawing to grief, which many people are doing. Uh, we think about the many people that have lost loved ones, that have lost health 
and well-being in these days, and we know that grief is rampant among us, and uh, it is a powerful, powerful force. And one of the ways to wrestle with grief is to draw away and draw near to God and ask God to comfort us and console us. So it's not surprising that Jesus tries to get away. But of course, the people from all the towns follow him, and it says right in the text, and Jesus had compassion on them. That's a, that's a wonderful word, compassion. It really means to, to be able to relate to other people's suffering. And uh, it's a little different than the word empathy, which means that you actually feel other people's sufferings. Uh, compassion is a special, in its own right, in the sense that we are moved to enter into suffering on behalf of the other person. We give up our place, our source of comfort, and enter into an action or a behavior that alleviates others' suffering. To have compassion is to be moved to do something. And so Jesus has compassion. He gives up his plan for his vacation, and he heals all their sick. And then, gathered in a desert place, the disciples come to him and say, what are we going to do with all these people? They're here and there's, there's no place for them to, to get food. And uh, we, we will dismiss everybody and send them into the towns nearby so that they can buy food and take care of themselves. And uh, Jesus says, there's no need for them to do that. You take care of them. You feed them. How are we going to do that? I am reminded that uh, in many ways, uh, this is a story about people having compassion, about taking care of other people. In these days, uh, the, the debate goes on about what are we to do about people that are suffering and hurting. Uh, you, I'm sure on television, have seen the lines of people that are lining up for food banks, not so much in, in our area, but in other places of the country. Uh, there are multiple uh, gatherings going on in our midst at Bader Field, uh, out of the PAL in Atlantic City, uh, in many other locations. People uh, are working in partnership with the Community Food Bank of Southern New Jersey and putting out food for people to simply drive by and pick up. And um, I don't know whether all the need is being met, but it's certainly not by uh, lack of trying. And so we are working hard at sharing with other people, entering into their sorrow and their suffering, and doing something about it. Sharing that, uh, the food that we have. And that is such an important part of our life together and our call as disciples. Jesus says to the disciples in this story, don't worry, you don't have to dismiss them to go to the towns outside. You take care of them, you feed them. This is really a story about what are we called to do and to be as disciples. You know, a lot of times I hear people say that um, God helps those who help themselves. Now, I've never actually seen the biblical quote that backs up that sentiment, but it certainly is a sentiment that I hear a lot in our culture and in our society. And that has historically been a way that some people address helping others. Let them pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. Goes way back in time and in culture to an argument that goes on between uh, political forces about what are we to do about people that are poor, that are hungry, that are in need. Clearly, the gospel comes down on the side of compassion. That it is our call, our calling, to use our resources and to share with others, to enter into their suffering, and by doing something about it, to alleviate their suffering. To empathize would to be to starve yourself to the point of being really, really hungry. To be compassionate means you take some of your food, uh, some of the excess food that we have, and make it available and share it with others. Give of our resources to take care of others. Clearly, we're called in a suffering world to show some compassion. I, over a hundred years ago, 
there was a very interesting dilemma that happened in the church life, which is still getting played out today. Two major forces were at work in the end of the 1800s. One was called the social gospel movement, and the other was called the, the movement of evangelism, uh, evangelicals we call them. Those two forces are still very present today, and uh, they have very different means of uh, sharing the gospel. The social gospel taught that uh, if we show compassion uh, on individuals and they were to turn their life around and be saved, the same could be said about uh, a whole society, that we could in fact bring about uh, heaven on earth if we just worked hard enough at it and worked as a progressive movement to bring about the alleviation of suffering through the sharing of resources. After the First World War, after the Depression, the terrible plight of what happened in Europe, mainline theologians such as Reinhold Niebuhr, Paul Tillich, even to some extent uh, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, others of that ilk and that era, taught that you know the terrible devastation of the First World War, the Depression, and later the Second World War and the ensuing Cold War had taught us that perhaps the total depravity of humanity was so great that we couldn't hope to reform society to the point where we would alleviate suffering. Perhaps the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven that Jesus came to announce wasn't possible in human history, but would have to be something that God accomplished after we were done. For some, I suppose, you might argue that uh, why show compassion? Why work so hard to alleviate suffering if it's not possible for us to fix this world? If it's going to be totally depraved, if people are going to act out of narcissism and uh, individualism and hoard and be greedy, why should we do anything to alleviate that? If God is going to fix it, let God come and take care of it. But the gospel is clear. Jesus calls his disciples to continue to act, to act on people's suffering that they see right in front of them, not to avoid it. You do something about it. You go and feed those people. The miracle of this story is really the fact that Jesus came to do exactly that, to enter into our suffering and to do something about it. The God of the Most High, the great God, creator of the universe, in Jesus Christ, comes down, bends down to kiss a broken and a tortured humanity, to enter into our suffering, to bear with us the pains of thirst and hunger, of healing, of sorrow. That's really the miracle, is that in this story we see the very entirety of the gospel because it's in Jesus Christ that God has come down to show compassion on our world and if we are followers of Jesus we will do likewise with our time with our energy with our talents we will expend ourselves empty ourselves for the sake of the gospel and for our discipleship in Jesus you know, uh, I can't help but think about uh, Jean Webster when I read this story of the way that uh, she came to a turning point in her life. Uh, Jean Webster was a chef in the Atlantic City casinos, the hotels before casinos. She worked for 50 years to a point where she had uh, heart problems and was uh, laid off from work. She was about 55 years old. And on the way home from work, it says on the historic plaque, on Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, she saw two guys eating out of a garbage, pan, garbage can. And she said to them, don't do that. Come home to my house and I will give you breakfast. Here's a woman who worked for 40, 45 years in the casino industry as a chef, which is tough work. Um, she ended up being able to supervise over 600 people. I mean, she was an incredible story of success if anyone deserved to go and take a rest and uh, take it easy 
and uh, go to a deserted place and enjoy communion with God and not get stressed out or worried, it was Jean Webster. But instead, she used that moment to show compassion on others. She had a turning point in her life and the real work that she did of feeding people after 40 years of working in the industry, her real task in, uh, in the eyes of God began in the, the time that she spent feeding people, those two, and then the next day four, and then the next day eight, and the story went on to the point where she was feeding 120, 125,000 meals a year um, for many, many years. And she counted on God to sustain her and to multiply the loaves and the fishes to do that. And I can only attest that I saw it happen time and time again, uh, that uh, that miracle of multiplication went on and on and on. Um, I will forever be changed uh, by what I saw and witnessed, and I will be moved as the disciples were to show compassion in my life because of what I have seen God do in God's world as God shows compassion for us still. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the witness of the gospel, for the purpose uh, that you sent Jesus to earth to help us to understand our meaning and our being as your children, to be here for one another, to be moved in our human emotions by the suffering that we see, and so do something to alleviate that suffering. May we not sit back and just assume that all the gifts and talents that we have received are for ourselves and because of our own self-worth, but rather, Lord, help us to understand, as your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, understood that he was sent to empty himself and enter into other people's suffering so that he might lift them up and alleviate that pain. May we hear the words that Jesus spoke to his own disciples when we hear him say, you go and feed those people. Amen? Amen. Amen. As we get ready to come to communion, let's sing a, a song that is a song of gratitude. It's uh, printed in your bulletin. It's called Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. We should have an insert for the bulletin uh, for communion. Uh, please let's join together using that resource. Uh, if you receive the mailing uh, this week, you'll have that resource in, the, in your packet. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. People will come from east and west and from north and south and sit, sit at, at table, table in, in the, the kingdom, kingdom of God. 
This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share the feast which he has prepared. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Give thanks to God. It is good. It is for God is great. His love is everlasting. Holy Lord, God Almighty, who made this world a place for Jesus Christ, and before he was born, promised his coming in the words of the prophets. We thank you for this supper, which is for us a sign of his returning to claim his lands and people. told your story, healed the sick, was a friend of sinners. Obeying you, he took up his cross and was murdered by people he loved. We praise you that he is not dead, but is risen to rule the world, and that he is still the friend of sinners. We trust him to overcome every power to hurt or divide us, so that when you bring in your promised kingdom, we will celebrate victory with him. Remembering the Lord Jesus, we break bread and share one cup, announcing his death for the sins of the world and telling his resurrection to all people and nations. Great God, give your Holy Spirit in the breaking of bread so that we may be drawn together and joined to Christ the Lord. Receive new life. Remain his glad and faithful people until we feast with him in glory. O God, who has called us from death to life, we give ourselves to you, and with the church throughout all the ages, we thank you for your saving love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. For thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I hope you have a, a bread that you use every day that we can set aside for the special purpose for which we are doing this today. And, you know, it wasn't just on the night of uh, Holy Thursday during uh, Holy Week that we believe Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, but in this very story of the feeding of the 5,000, he takes bread, he blesses it, he breaks it, and he gives it to them to give to all people. It's uh, very sacramental. So today I'm using a piece of bread that I got out of the food pantry here at the church. This is a a bagel. It is a cinnamon raisin bagel that was baked right here on the island by folks at the Acme uh, who provide an incredible amount of resources and food that we distribute regularly, weekly, to people who are in need and hungry right here in Brigantine. This is an activity that has gone on throughout COVID-19 and at the risk of the volunteers and uh, my administrator Brenda Rupp who come every week to share this with other people who are hungry and in need. I can't think of a more appropriate bread to use for this sacrament in the name of Jesus Christ today. Jesus took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to his friends and said, take, eat, this is my body that is broken for you. And in that same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a symbol of a new covenant that is forged in my blood. Every time you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me for the forgiveness of sins. 
Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all God's benefits. Let's be joined together in prayer. O God, our help, we, we thank, thank you, you for this supper, supper shared in the, in the Spirit with your Son, your son Jesus, Jesus, who makes us new and strong, and strong who brings, brings us life eternal. eternal. We, we praise you for giving us all good gifts in him, and pledge ourselves to serve you, even as in Christ you have served us. Amen. This song is for Beth Bliss, one of her favorites. If you turn on the back of the communion insert, you'll find the words for leaning on the everlasting arm.
return no one evil for evil, but do that which is good and right in God's eyes. Have some compassion, people. Let's not turn away from folks who are in need. Let us find a way in these moments, like Jacob, uh, to hear what God is saying to us, to take on a new name, to take on the blessing of being God's followers in the world and do what we can with what we have to bring about the alleviation of suffering for others. What does God require of us? Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with God and with one another. Amen. Amen. Amen.